ready to start. Welcome everyone. The topic today is optimal power flow, OPF. This is one of the very important topics in running electrical grids. So we will see the techniques that are being used. And this is a topic that has to do with modeling the grid, which we have done in the past weeks with the admittance matrix and mixing this with optimization. So we will talk a bit on, about optimization, capitalizing on the courses you had uh, before. So this is simply, or to put it uh, from a mathematical viewpoint, it is a very classical problem. We want to minimize the cost of operation of a grid subject to the physical constraints that are due to the physics of the grid, due to the fact that we have an AC grid, uh, primarily. And also limits on what we can do with the devices that uh, control the grid. What are the devices that control the grid? Well, the first ones are the generators. The primary problem we have when running a grid is to balance consumption and production. So generation and loads should be balanced. So that's the first uh, thing we'd, we will want to do. Now there are other more subtle things that happen in, in grids that we will not discuss in detail in this course, but in projects you might discuss that. Um, there are things like batteries in more modern grids. So you could decide, for example, instead of having a generator to have a battery that could absorb some of the production during peak hours, for example, when there is sunshine and solar PVs if this is producing too much or if this is producing uh, voltage problems, over voltage, for example, then you may decide to use batteries. Of course, you will need to drain those batteries. You will need to empty them at some point, uh, which typically you would do during the night. So the control of those batteries would be something that fits exactly here. More classically, you have things like tap changers. Did anybody hear about that? What is a tap changer? Any idea? Exactly. On a variable transformer, you can adapt the output voltage. And by adapting the output voltage, you can reduce or increase uh, the, the line currents and therefore increase or reduce the voltage. So this is one of the things we may want to do as well. Uh, there might be also capacitor banks or sources of reactive power. We will illustrate a bit what reactive power does in a grid. Reactive power has to do with, as you know, voltage problem and also reduction of line losses. The cost of the grid is, of course, the cost of generation. If you have fuel-based generation, so if you run a diesel generator, then the cost of generation is at least has a component which is proportional to the amount of fuel that you pay. Um, but also, typically, we may want to add penalty for violation of voltage or current limits. We can put that as penalty in the cost or in the constraints. We will see in a simple way how to put it on the constraints. Typical constraints, therefore, are the maximum capabilities of all the hardware that we have. Let's look at the toy example that we will decline in various, uh, in, in this course, applying the various techniques. In the lab, you will have to run a bit more complicated, more realistic examples, but we will show the major techniques on this one. This is a very simple grid, a triangle. It has three generators at three buses, and it also has loads at those buses. So this is typically a high voltage grid, right, which is ignoring the details. Probably the generator might not be connected directly here, uh, but we ignore those details. Uh, it has also three lines that have impedances that are shown here. Uh, typically, there would be also transverse impedances that, for simplicity here, I'm ignoring. And I'm showing all the numbers in per unit. And the, uh, here I'm assuming there are load consumptions of 100 megawatts at each of those two generators, 500 megawatts at this one. To run a grid, a typical way is to have 
one generator that plays a special role that is called the slack generator or the slack bus, uh, this one. So the role of the slack bus is, what is the role of the slack bus? Compensate for losses, it's true, but more for than for losses, to compensate for the power mismatch at every point in time. So as if you run a grid, uh, for, you need to adapt constantly in real time to the power mismatch or in quasi real time. If I press a button to start a kettle that consumes plus one kilowatt, you need to generate plus one kilowatt. In the OPF formulation that we will see here, we don't account for that. We don't do an OPF in real time whenever somebody is changing the load consumption. We do the OPF to set the operating points of the grid at a time scale of typically 5, 10, 15 minutes. In more modern settings, we may do it over several seconds when we do voltage control in distribution networks, as we will do in the lab. But certainly at the microscopic time scale, which is orders of tens of milliseconds, you have other mechanisms. So those mechanisms is to have the generator control, if it's an inverter-based generator, it will act as a voltage source. So it will keep the voltage constant here. And in order to keep the voltage constant, the controller of the generator is forced to generate as much current as is needed for the operation of the grid. So this one in this example, I'm assuming, is the slack. Um, which means that when we say here 500 megawatt, it's an estimated average over, for example, a 15 minute period. In reality, it will vary all the time and this will take care of the variation. So this is my very simple grid. I also have line limits. The line limitations come typically from maximum current. A given cable has a maximum capacity of carrying a certain current. If it, there is too high current, the line will get hot. The insulators will get damaged and you will have very large losses. So we would like to avoid this. So uh, the, the normal way to present the, those limitations is to put limits on the current, but to simplify here, what is often done is to put a limit on the, the power flow over, over the line here. So here I'm assuming there's 300 megawatts of uh, apparent power maximum capacity here and 200 on the other two lines. I said megawatts, this is the uh, apparent power, so it has an active and reactive uh, component, so people very often for that they will say MVA instead of megawatt, but uh, it's the same. So this is our grid, and assume the only things I want to minimize is the cost of running those three generators, and assume those three generators have cost, that is one per unit of megawatt hour, here a generator two, 15 here, and 225 here. In other words, generator two is cheap, generator one is very expensive, and generator three is extremely expensive. And since most of the load is here, then we, have, we would like to generate at generator two as much as possible and carry it through the grid, but the grid is limiting. It has only 200 megawatt here, 300 megawatt, so exactly 500 megawatt of uh, total capacity on those two lines, but there's also a maximum capacity of 200 here. So we need to incorporate all those limits, which can be done, at least uh, mathematically it's easy to formulate. I want to minimize the total cost of operation. Here I'm assuming there is cost only for the active power, which is called G, of those generators here. I'm assuming the generators also uh, produce some reactive power, which in this case is assumed to be for free. And the loads are consuming here, I'm assuming the, uh, the, the angle of the load, so the, the cos phi of the load is fixed, which is of course a uh, simplification, but very often it's true, and this angle is typically small. So SI is the complex power injection at node 1. So it is the generated power minus the loads. I call it power injection. 
which is the classical terminology used. Power injection means we count positively what goes into the grid. So consumption is negative here. So SI, this is the complex power at node I. And you probably recognize here the nodal power injection, the nodal power formulas that can be written using the admittance matrix. If I call Y the complex admittance matrix of this grid, then the injected power at node I is given by the complex voltage phasor at node I multiplied by the sum over J of, so the star here means complex conjugate, YIJ VJ here. So those are the admittance matrix uh, equations here. So I have a complex voltage here which is a variable that will come in my optimization problem, that is the electrical state of the grid. That's one way to represent the electrical state of the grid, because as we know from last, from previous weeks, we can derive all the power flows, the line currents, all quantities of interest from those complex uh, numbers here. V1 equal one, this comes from which hypothesis? The slack. So this is exactly, this is the slack bus. So that means that's the one that's imposing the voltage in magnitude. So this is a complex number equal to one. So that means the magnitude is one. So I take per unit the nominal voltage of uh, the slack bus. And it means also the phase angle is zero. Now the phase angle is just a convention. You always measure an angle, a phase angle, with respect to some reference. So here I'm simply saying, I take the zero reference of phase angle as that of the slack bus here. So this is the, it's not a magnitude, right? It's the complex number one with zero imaginary part. Here I have the maximum capabilities of the generators. I'm assuming rectangular capabilities means the active and reactive powers have independent bounds. Depending on the type of generator, this may be more complicated if you have Ge this is typical for generators that are, I would say, fuel-based, for generators that are based on uh, inverters, so from batteries, for example, you would have more complicated uh, uh, constraints uh, due to, uh, there would be typically a constraint on the norm, on the module of the complex number GI plus JQI. Here, those are the, this is the constraint on the voltage magnitude. Uh, this is for the quality of service of the grid. I want that the voltage is within bounds. So those bounds are typically very close to one. So V min is perhaps 0 0.95 and V max 1.05. And here you recognize the part of this, which is equal to the power flow on the branch IJ. So here I'm saying that on branch IJ, the power flow is given by the power flow limit here. Um, here I'm writing a, another constraint. Here I'm computing the line current on this branch. Uh, this is ignoring, there are transverse elements. There would be a, a second term that I'm ignoring here. The line current would be given by this, and I have a constraint on the line current. Very often we have this constraint or that constraint, having both typically is redundant. Uh, this is easier to understand. This is physically the correct thing. Now, if the voltage magnitudes are close to one, then those two things are, are very close anyhow. So this is the problem we are formulating. So to solve it, I can ask MATLAB to solve it by asking f min con. This is a constrained optimization problem. I have uh, a sm relatively small number of optimization variables. I have G1, G2, G3. Uh, all the Gs and the Vs are, and the Qs are optimization variables. Uh, I did it here, so I simply, by brute force, I asked MATLAB to solve for it. And as a first step, I'm not so much interested on how MATLAB solves it, which is what you can do when your problem size is small. And this is the result. The result is in red here and blue. In red are the states of the buses, and in blue are the flows on the lines. Small cap v, uh, small case v 
is the, uh, the voltage magnitude, so, and theta is the angle, the phase angle of the voltage, so the complex number of voltage is um, module one and argument theta. Of course, we find one and zero because this is an assumption we put, it's the slack bus. And here I found the total generation of this node, which is 400 um, of active power and minus 80 of uh, reactive power, which means this one is working at its maximum capacity, even though it's not the cheapest, right? The cheapest would be this one. This one is working at a capacity that is less, because its capacity, uh, all, all three nodes have the same capacity. And this one is working at a capacity which is small, which is what we would like, because that's the most expensive one. And we see the power flows here. So here there's 235 uh, megawatts of active power flowing on this line, and close to 200 uh, flowing on this line here. And there is some reactive power flowing on each of the lines. Uh, of course, the total module here will be exactly 200, so this line is limiting. This is the bottleneck in our grid, the line from 2 to 3. And we see also the marginal costs. It's a quantity of interest uh, called lambda p. Margi marginal cost means if I increase the load at this node, at this bud, if I increase by some epsilon, let's say by one kilowatt, this is by how much uh, the price would increase here. Now prices are in franc per megawatt hour, but proportionally uh, we can think of it as increasing by some epsilon the, uh, the, uh, the load consumption here. What would be the cost here? How can I compute this? Well, we will see that if the problem can be formulated as a convex problem, we can use Lagrange multipliers. If it is not usable as with Lagrange multipliers, we can simply redo the optimization problem by adding one kilowatt of consumption, computing the new total cost, total cost of operation of the entire grid, and seeing what's the delta, how much more. So we see that uh, in this given operation, the cost of electricity at site 3 here is 200 to 20, 226, at least the marginal cost. Here it is 1, and here it is 69. So this is used in some market models to derive the price of electricity. Here we are in a very constrained grid. We are in a grid that is limiting, so the problem is the grid. Right? which is what is happening now in most countries. It's happening in continental Europe, it's happening in, uh, in the US, it's happening in many places where you have huge variability in the generation. This very cheap generation of one megawatt here might be, for example, uh, wind energy produced in a part of the continent where there is not much demand, and this might be uh, consumption in a place that's very far from where the production is. So in cases like this, then you see that the prices depend on the solution of this optimization problem. I solved the same problem, but I changed the line capacities. I multiplied them by 10. So assume in Europe we build new high voltage lines across the continent everywhere, we multiply by 10 the capacities of all the lines, which is highly unrealistic because building one high voltage line has a major impact on the landscape. Uh, it's ugly, let's face it. Uh, you can put it underground, but that's extremely expensive. Um, so uh, this is something very difficult to do. But in MATLAB, it's very easy to do, so I did it. And what do we observe? Well, what are the changes that you observe here? Now we have zero power from the most expensive. Now we have zero, or very, the, the most expensive is this one, and we have a zero power from the most expensive one. So now the grid is able to shuffle the power around. There are grid losses, of course, but 
the, the grid uh, is still able to carry the power from the inexpensive thing here. And we see the impact on the price. The price is 15 franc here, the marginal price, which is the price of this generator. The total demand on this grid is 700. And we have three generators that have a capacity of 400. So we cannot use only the cheap one, but we can run the cheap one at maximum capacity, which we do here. And then the second one that we use is this one, which we... So the marginal price is given by the price of this guy, which is, if I add something, I need to pull more from this guy. And since the cost here is linear, the marginal price is 15, which is exactly what we find, 15 francs per megawatt hour. And it's almost the same in the other nodes here. It's not exactly the same because of line losses. When we transport electricity, we lose something. So the costs are not exactly the same. Here it's less because we are close to the cheaper generator. Here it's a bit more. But you see the dramatic change in prices that goes from 225, so close to the price of this, uh, the marginal price of this generator, down to 15. Right. So that's one of the economical problems for the operation of grids for your generation for the future 20 to 50 years in practically everywhere in the world. The problem will be to manage the power flow such that we ripe the benefits of the very cheap production that is due to renewables. It's cheap and it will become cheaper and cheaper, but it is located usually at places that you can't control. So sometimes it will be located at the wrong place. So the people that are running the large transmission grids, Swiss grid, RTE in France, they push very much for upgrading the transmission link, and they have good arguments for that. And this is illustrated by this uh, small analysis. So the problem we have seen is in fact what is called a dispatch plan, or a simple version of a dispatch plan, where what I've done here, I've asked at one time slot, what is the generation I should do? Now, if you, have, if you do that over several time slots, typically because you would have a forecast of the loads that change over time, the loads are extremely well predicted at the, times, at the scale of transmission grids. So, at the scale of Switzerland, France, or the, uh, Germany, uh, we know the loads at granularity of 15 minutes with an accuracy of the order of a percent. So those are very accurately forecasted. The productions are a bit more difficult to forecast if they are renewable. Wind and solar are a bit more difficult to forecast, but they can be forecasted with an accuracy of between 5 to 20 percent, depending on the technology and the forecasting uh, technology and where they are located. Some places are easier to forecast than others. So if you do those forecasts, you would do what is called a dispatch plan. Dispatch plan means you redo this optimization, but over a, a horizon of time. For example, here I'm assuming the time slot is one hour, and I want to minimize the operation over the next 24 hours. This is what you do when you participate in the day ahead market. You want to sell your, uh, your, your generation, for example, then you will do this. And the grid operator will also do something similar to check whether the grid uh, will be working correctly. The difference when you do a dispatch plan compared to a single shot uh, dispatch is that you typically have constraints on how fast you can change the generator set points. Uh, those are called the ramping constraints. So this is the constraint on the derivative, the discrete time derivative of the active or sometimes also reactive power uh, of the generators. For example, if you have a gas turbine that is not working, uh, then it cannot start immediately. So if you decide to start it, there will be uh, a constraint on how fast you can uh, change its uh, production. 
If the time horizon is one hour, of course, those ramping constraints are not very limiting. If you do that for voltage control over time horizon of minute or sub-second, then those constraints uh, become uh, very important. And as we will see in the lab, there might be also startup costs. A little quiz that is posted on SpeakUp. So if you have a smartphone and downloaded the app, you will find it. If you don't, you can use your computer and uh, open a browser and go to this room number. And I invite you to study this question and give me your answer. And the correct answer is B, which is the majority answer. So the question is, so here I'm showing some branch power flow. And I am ambiguous, I'm not showing where it is. So I'm putting the value at the top of the arrow means it's the power exiting bus one into the line one three. And the question is whether this is the same power as the one that's exiting the line. And of course the answer is no. The difference being the power losses. In fact, I said the difference, but typically we take as convention that the power is counted from the bus into the line. So if I take this power plus this power, which is this power minus the one counted in the reverse direction, so the sum of the power is given by the power flow formula of, uh, uh, obtained from the uh, admittance matrix is equal to the loss here. So when I formulate uh, the problem with this quantity, if I remove the module here, this quantity without the modules is the power flow exiting bus I into the line IJ. If I do the reverse, so if I flip I and J, so if I VJ, YYJ, VJ minus VI, I will obtain a different number. And the sum of the two is the power loss on the line. And of course, one of the goals of optimal power flow indirectly here by reducing the total cost of generation will lead to also reducing the power losses because the losses will come at a cost. B is saying simply that G1 minus L1, which is the real part of the total power uh, injected into node bus 1, is equal to the sum the real part of the sum of the powers uh, that exit the nodes, and this is the power flow balance at the nodes that you have seen with the admittance matrix. So this is uh, correct. So we have put the landscape. This is how the OPF uh, can be formulated. And in fact, the major difficult part of the OPF is to formulate it, and this is not coming from things we see today, but from we saw the past weeks, how we write the grid uh, equations and the power flow equations in a grid. What we will discuss today and next week is what are the common simple techniques that are used for solving this problem. And it turns out that mathematically it is a bad problem. So this is why it's a module of this course. If it would be a simple problem, it would be simply an application exercise at the end of the previous module. But because it's a bad problem, we need to talk more about it. So first we need to talk about convex optimization. So OPF is an optimization problem. Now the world of optimization is divided according to two criterion. There are easy or good problems and bad problems. The good problems are the ones that are continuous and convex. So continuous means the optimization variables are real or complex numbers, as opposed to discrete, which are integers or binary variables. Discrete problems typically lead to combinatorial problems that tend to have exponential complexity, or the brute force solutions of exponential complexity. And to solve them, uh, then we're in the world of how to solve NP-hard problems. That's one dimension of complexity. We will find some of it in the OPF when we talk about the unit commitments. In the OPF that I presented, I said I have three generators, and they all work. And the question is, continuous, how much? 
should I use of each generator? So I made it a continuous problem. But in some cases, I will have discrete problems where I have some generators that I may decide to operate or not. If I operate them, I have a startup cost. This is the example I mentioned a minute ago of a gas turbine. A gas turbine that runs needs to be rotating because you know from your energy conversion course, I guess, that the torque on a rotating system that is not rotating is zero. So you cannot start it uh, while it's not rotating. So it's, that's why we have an electric uh, starter in a car for the, to, 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 to start the engine. So those generators must be turning. If they're not turning, then we need to do something. We, we need to start them. That will have a cost. So uh, there is a discrete part in the optimization problem. If I start them or not, there is a jump. It's not a continuous variable that I can say. Uh, I can start it 50% or 0%, I start or I don't. So there is the discrete versus continuous. Discrete typically makes the problem ugly, except from good cases. There are problems that are discrete, like shortest path on a graph, which is a nice problem because there's Dijkstra algorithm, uh, but those are exceptions. Most discrete problems uh, lead to uh, NP, uh, are, are NP-complete, usually. Then the other dimension is continuous, so, but even if the problem is continuous, uh, the problem may be easy or difficult depending whether it's convex. Well, this is the state of the art today. Mathematicians have found lots of efficient algorithms to solve a very, very large class of convex problems. Convex problems uh, have very nice uh, uh, solvers, non-convex problems, even if they are continuous, usually they can be hard to solve exactly. So what is exactly convex? Well, a convex problem is this. At least that's one way to formulate it. The difficulty of, in this part of optimization is not so much in the content itself, but the fact that the same content can be presented in multiple forms and small details matter. So what I do is I recommend to follow one book and only one. So you should have your own reference for convex optimization and follow it for the rest of your life. Don't deviate from it. Right? I follow uh, Boyd's book, Stephen Boyd and Van der Berg's book. And this is a convention I, I will use here. So with this convention, a convex problem is about minimizing a convex function over a convex set. Right. You have variants, like you can maximize a concave function over a convex set. This is exactly equivalent. If you take the minus of a convex function, you have a concave function, and minimizing the opposite is the same as maximizing the function. But I will stick to that always to avoid getting lost here. What is a convex set? Well, a convex set is illustrated here. This is something such that if we go from one point to the next, uh, the segment that lies between the two is entirely in the domain. So this is not convex, right? This croissant-shaped thing is not convex. And what is a convex function? The convex function is one such that the graph is below the chords. So if I put a straight line between two values of the function, all the intermediate values on the straight line are above the true value. And concave is the opposite. And most functions are neither convex nor concave, like the sine functions, or something like this, uh, which is uh, neither convex nor concave. It's locally convex uh, and locally concave, but globally nothing. Here. Uh, Convexity is a, pro is a property that is useful in practice. However, it's not a fundamental property of a problem. So this is why uh, we will do lots of things about problem transformation. What do I mean by fundamental property of a problem? If I have a problem, uh, that is, I can describe it with a number of variables. For example, we showed the OPF by showing the complex voltage. If instead of the complex voltage, I give you the magnitude of the voltage and the angle. 
In other words, if I use a rectangular versus polar coordinate, I have the same problem. I'm just using a one-to-one -one mapping, uh, bijective mapping from one coordinate system to the other. But convexity will not be invariant. If the problem is convex, then it's a geometric property that is preserved only by linear transformation, because I'm saying the straight line must be in the set. If I change the coordinate systems, what is a straight line will no longer be in one coordinate system, is not a straight line in the other. So a problem that is convex in rectangular coordinate is very likely not convex in polar coordinates, and vice versa. So convexity is really a property of a specific formulation of a problem. So it's not a fundamental property of the true problem. But we are only in 2017. Mathematicians have not yet found what is the, what are the fundamentally fundamental properties of problems that make them easy to solve, optimization problem. The only thing we know today is find a way to formulate it as a convex problem. Now, there are problems that are formulable as a convex problem and some that are not. And in fact, there's a lot of research in the OPF where people are trying to find a way to formulate the OPF problem such that it becomes convex. But has not yet converged. We know approximate ways. We know how to tweak it a bit. And so I'm just uh, giving a forward reference to the fact that we will see the OPF is, of course, a non-convex problem. Why are convex problems special? Well, if, so if I'm minimizing a convex function over a convex set, then any local minimum is a global minimum. That's the fundamental property of convex problems. Of course, there are not only convex functions that have this property, but certainly functions that are grossly non-convex like this one have many local minima. Here, this one has three local minima. Heuristics solvers for problems, if they are solvers for convex problems, they will work well because you will simply try to go from a local minima minimum. So you try to decrease the objective until you can't. When you're stuck, you cannot decrease the objective. You know you've reached a local minimum, and you know that's a fundamental theorem about convex problems. Any local minimum of a convex problem is a global minimum. Whereas this is not true for global, uh, for non-convex problems, and this typically is what happens also in reality. If you ask MATLAB or uh, Gurobi or other solvers to solve for you a non-convex problems, they will return to you a local minimum. They will not find the global minimum. So in a case like this, it's easy. There are only three. You can start from different and look at the minimum. But if you're solving an optimal power flow problem in a three-phase network, in rectangular coordinate, you have six dimensions at every bus for the electrical state. If you have a small grid with 10 buses, you have already 60 dimensions. So we are in a problem which is not exponentially large, but is more complicated than things we can draw here. So this is a typical thing you have to be aware of. You probably encountered this difficulty already. When we do a convex, when we solve a convex problem, the initialization doesn't matter. If I have a heuristic that starts from here, it will stop when it has found a global minimum, which must be the solution you're looking for. If you use a heuristic for a non-convex problem, the result will depend on the initial guess you give to the problem. So problem solvers for non-convex problems usually ask you to find an initial guess. If I start this prob the, from here, for example, probably the solver will stop here. If I start from there, it will return me this solution. That's an unpleasant property of those solvers, is that you need to find a way to initialize them. What we do, for example, for OPF, if we want to solve uh, the OPF problem, which is a problem like this one, we typically use an approximation formulation of the problem, which is like this one. We find the exact solution of the approximate problem, and we give that as initial guess for the exact solver. OK, let's test your preferred reference on definition of convexity. 
and find out out of those three problems which one, if any, are convex. And the correct answer, which is the majority <coughs> vote, is F, which means the first one is not. So this is a... Oh no, that's the break. The, this one is maximizing a convex function, right? So minimizing a convex function like this one, if I minimize a convex function, I will have a local minimum only. If I maximize on an interval, for example, the interval that is drawn here, in fact, I will find two, max, two local maxima, and the local maxima are at the edge here. So maximizing convex functions on polytopes, things that are defined by uh, linear inequalities, is doable. In fact, there are methods for doing that but is not a convex problem and in the general case still has exponential complexity. Here there are two edges, but if I have a large number of dimensions, I need to look at all the possible combinations of constraint to find all what are all the candidate edges. So this is certainly not a convex problem. This is the minimization of x squared, which is the prototype of the convex function, over an interval, which is a prototype of a convex set in 1D is all convex sets in 1D are intervals. And this is uh, maximizing a linear function. Now, maximizing linear is the same as minimizing minus this. And the linear function is both concave and convex. Right? So this is minimizing a linear function, which is therefore of the form minimizing a convex function, over a set that is defined by those inequalities, and those inequalities are all linear inequalities, so combinations of linear constraints always provides a convex set, so this is a convex set, a linear therefore convex function that I minimize by putting, it's the same as minimize minus x minus y, therefore this is also a convex problem. We do a break and we resume at 10.15. Uh,